Hi, I'm Ant and welcome to part six of our House Church series. Today's topic is about traditions and getting out of Babylon. So many things we do traditionally in churches that aren't necessarily scriptural. So what's the first thing that we'll talk about? Well, I think about the day you meet. Is there any particular day that we're expected to meet? Well, some people would say the Sabbath, which is Friday night through to Saturday night, your traditional Jewish Sabbath. Some people say, no, that God changed it and you've got to meet on a Sunday, which is what a lot of the traditional churches do. But what is the truth? Well, you can meet on any day. That's the truth. So if you meet on a Saturday night, a Sunday morning, Sunday for lunch, have lunch together, meet on a Wednesday night, no matter what you're doing in all of these scenarios, you're still having church. Now, is the Sabbath still valid? Well, yes and no. As far as meeting, no. As far as a day of rest, yes. So in the original context of Genesis, it says that it was the evening and then the morning. And so basically that's how the days worked in the Old Testament. So when you have a day of rest, all you're doing is giving your body a day of rest. Now in the traditional church services, I couldn't do that because I'd work Monday through to Friday in my job. Then on Saturday, I'd have to get out and mow the lawns and do all the work around the house. Then Sunday was church and you think, great, we're well, getting a day of rest. But I wasn't, I was involved with kids church and often we'd have to, you know, take quite a big group of kids, sometimes take them twice because the church had more than one service. And by the end of all that, you definitely haven't had a rest. And this went week after week, month after month. And of course, that's a recipe for burnout, especially if you do it for years on end. So God knows that we need a rest. Yes, have a rest. Now, that's the basic premise of the Sabbath. Now you can also look at Sabbath as what was based back in Genesis where you had six days where God worked and one day where he rest and same with the earth for 6,000 years you've got the time of work where there is labor we're underneath a hard cruel taskmaster the devil but then on the seventh the earth will rest when messiah comes jesus and he reigns and rules over the earth so that's another way of looking at the sabbath too so there's a lot of different patterns and things in this but you can't make a law out of it and say that we have to meet on any particular day in colossians chapter 2 verses 16 to 17 it says this let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So basically what Paul is saying here is that we're not to be judged on all these things like Sabbaths, new moon festivals and all of those types of things, which were very Jewish at the time. But what a lot of people miss here is it's not just Jewish. It's also pagan. Pagans have got different rest days. Pagans have got different festivals. They have different celebrations and traditions. And a lot of these things have become mixed up and crossed over into the church world. Now, in a house church, we don't recommend that you celebrate these things, quite obviously. But uh, should we celebrate the feasts that God instituted? Well, I think the answer is yes. I'm not saying you're obligated to. You don't have to celebrate all of them. There were the three key feasts. There was Passover, there was Pentecost and Tabernacles. Why Passover? Well, Passover because that relates to Jesus coming, dying, being buried and raised again on the third day. Why Pentecost? Well, Pentecost not only was at the time when Moses was given the law on Mount Sinai, but more importantly for the church, that was when the Holy Spirit was given and the church exploded and started to go outwards. So that's a very significant event. And yes, a lot of churches celebrate Pentecost, and so they should. And Tabernacles, this is less known, but it's talking really about Christ's second return. Should we be looking for Christ's second return? Absolutely. But some people might say, hey, look, we celebrate Easter and Christmas and all of those types of things. Well, they are feasts. Now, you shouldn't be held to those things because they're pagan. As simple as that. But I find it rather amusing that people use this scripture and say, well, we're not held to the biblical feasts because, you know, Paul has basically told us not to. But they still go and celebrate the pagan feasts, which doesn't make sense. 
Paul has a lot of other things to say about this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 6, it says this, Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. So he's actually telling us to keep the feast but not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Well, what's the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth? Well, put Christ back into Passover. Have him as the centre of it. That's the new truth of what Passover is about. But there's many who celebrate Passover who don't do that. So on one hand, he's saying, don't be held to the feasts. You're not obligated to do them. But on another hand, he's saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, keep the feast of Passover. And I think it's pretty obvious why Jesus told us to do it. He was there and said to do this in remembrance of him. It's much more than communion. It's also Passover. So yes, there is a premise in some cases for keeping the feasts, but he says do it in an honest and sincere way. Keep Christ in the middle of it, because that's what the whole thing is all about. In the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 29 it says this, The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now what's Passover about? It's about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, for the Romans, what they did was they perverted things when Rome got into the church and took away Passover and made it Easter, which is a pagan celebration. So it became about the gods and goddesses and all of those sorts of things, which actually have their origins back towards Babylon. Now, we want to get out of Babylon. We don't want to be a part of that. So in house church, one thing we can do is get out of that system. In the traditional church system, we can't. Everywhere you go, they're either celebrating Easter or Christmas or all these other things, which are pagan. But uh, unless you get into a cult like the Seventh-day Adventists or JWs or something, well, then you won't end up celebrating those things. But in a house church... I've got a lot more liberty, so I can celebrate Passover, but I'm not expected to celebrate all the feasts. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting at verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as a wise man, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we want to provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So what's he saying here? He was talking about food and food sacrifice to idols. And that behind every idol is a demon. Now, of course, we are greater in Christ than those things. But you have to remember here that he's talking about the Lord's table, which is Passover, communion, Passover. And he says you're not supposed to mix the things of demons and idols with the things of Passover or communion, the Lord's table. Well, it's interesting because that's what the church has done. Easter, Ishtar or a store, that is an idol. She is a goddess. She's a goddess of sexual love, erotica, um, of war, of all of those types of things. So when you honour Christ, supposedly, by honouring it through the name of an idol, what you're actually doing is you're honouring the doctrine of demons. So for me to celebrate um, Easter is completely unacceptable. I'm always going to do the Passover because that's what God instituted in the Bible, and that's what brings out Christ. And as a matter of fact, Passover is a much richer explanation of what's happened on the cross 
than what Easter is. Now, a lot of Christians may beg to differ about that that are in traditional churches. I would have too, but once I started celebrating Passover, it opened up the whole Bible and made it richer. So yes, I do believe there is place for celebrating the feasts, even though we are not supposed to necessarily celebrate all of them. But we don't want to be like the heathen, which is what the regular church is like, celebrating feasts dedicated to pagan idols. If it goes one way, it goes the other. If you're not supposed to celebrate necessarily the Lord's feasts, if you don't be required to do that, why then do you celebrate the pagan ones and say that they're of the Lord? They're not. They're the doctrine of demons. So these sorts of things are the things that have trapped a lot of people in the church. And I believe many pastors will pay a price when they stand before Christ in judgment because they've misled the sheep. I'm not saying they'll lose their salvation, but I am saying that they will pay a price for it. Because had they have been faithful to the text of the Bible, they would have honoured him in the way that he said to honour him and not gone off on a tangent and gone after all the Roman Catholic and Babylonian traditions. In the book of 1 Maccabees, chapter 1, starting at verse 54, it says this, On the fifteenth day, the month of Kislev, which is the ninth month on the Hebrew calendar, in the year 145, King Antiochus set up the awful horror on the altar of the temple, and pagan altars were built in the towns throughout Judea. Pagan sacrifices were offered in front of the houses and in the streets. Any books of the law which were found were torn up and burned, and anyone who was caught with a copy of the sacred books or who obeyed the law was put to death by order of the king. Month after month, these wicked men used their power against the Israelites caught in the towns. On the 25th of the month, these same men offered sacrifices on the pagan altar erected atop of the altar in the temple. So here we go. This is not necessarily regarded by many as scripture, but it is nevertheless relevant history. And basically the 25th of Kislev, two years later, the temple was liberated and they sanctified. And that's where you get the feast of Hanukkah or the feast of dedication, which is in the 10th chapter of the gospel of John. Now it also says in 2 Maccabees chapter 10, verse 5, they rededicated the temple on the 25th day of the month of Kislev, the same day of the month on which the temple had been desecrated by the Gentiles. So once again, you've got this same date, the 25th day of Kislev. Now, the person who had desecrated this temple was a ruler named Antiochus Epiphanes IV, and he is an antichrist type figure. Now, the book of Daniel mentions him, so he's very famous, he was prophesied about, and he's a figure that fits a pattern that happened not only that time, but is in a time yet to come. And so all of this was tied in with the whole Christmas story by mixing together the pagan festivals with the date the 25th. Around this time, they were celebrating Saturnalia and Mithras worship, which was a week-long celebration, and they tied the two together and brought in the 25th of December. And so that's where we get Christmas from today. Now, you have to be very careful because Christmas, if that is the birth of Christ, that could be the time when the temple was liberated and they relit the menorah and the light came into the world. True. But it's also the time when the awful horror was set up in the temple and they desecrated it by sacrificing pigs on the altar. So what are we celebrating here? Are we celebrating Christ coming into the world or are we celebrating the Antichrist coming into the world? A lot of people in churches today, and your pastors will not tell you this, are actually celebrating a festival that might have more to do with the coming of the Antichrist than what it actually has to do with Christ. Now, I know that'll offend a lot of people, but in our household, we do not celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Hanukkah. But do we cut ourselves off from everybody else, like our family? The answer to that is no, we don't. We still meet for Christmas with the family. I love my family. It's just that we don't celebrate Christmas. But that's not going to stop me from getting together and spending time with the people that I love. So a lot of cults will cut themselves off completely from people. But in house church, we don't have to do that. You're not tied down by all these traditions. We choose to celebrate Hanukkah because it does honour Christ coming as the light of the world. But we're also very wary of Christmas because we believe it's setting up people for the coming Antichrist. 
In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, starting at verse 22, it says this, Now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, which is what we call today Hanukkah. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So it's interesting that at Hanukkah time, the Jews were trying to get Jesus to confess that he was the Christ. Now, interestingly, there's a lot of things when you talk about King Solomon that sort of point to the Antichrist. It's very interesting that they approached him on King Solomon's porch and also the fact that they basically asked him during Hanukkah or the Feast of Dedication. Jesus quickly put them aside because it was not his time, it was not the Passover, but he would have been aware that these people were trying to get him to fit in to the Hanukkah or the Feast of Dedication prophecies. Now that could mean he could be lined up with the Antichrist, which he is not. He very carefully put it aside and he put the whole thing down very quickly. So Jesus was not keen to align himself with Hanukkah as being him being the Christ. But there are so many today in the church world who are looking for their Christ coming at the time of Christmas, which is Hanukkah. Interesting that Jesus didn't want to do it. Why do we do it today? And why is it that we as a church in many churches want to honor God on a day of Mithras, which is an idol? And what's an idol? An idol is something that has a demon behind it. So God's not in it. He doesn't honor it. And I think that a lot of people need to think very carefully about these things. So just because I'm not necessarily required to celebrate Hanukkah. I'm also not required to celebrate Christmas, and I won't because it's a doctrine of demons. In Revelation chapter 18, it says this, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, Babylon the great has fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So in Revelation chapter 8, it's talking about the destruction of Babylon. And yes, Babylon is a literal place. But the whole world was taken up with Babylon. And a lot of our Christian churches have been infiltrated by the Babylonian religion. Easter, Christmas, Lent, all those sorts of things, even Good Friday, which is basically weeping for Tammuz. That was a day of mourning. All these things come out from Babylon. Now, it's saying that this is basically a habitation of demons. The whole world is following after it. And just look at what's going on in the world. When we're celebrating Easter, all the shops are filled with Easter eggs, rabbits, hot cross buns, all those sorts of things. And you'd think that the church would wake up, that if the whole world's doing it, something's wrong. Same with Christmas. Everywhere you go, they do say keep Christ in Christmas, but look at the whole world. It's all celebrating it. So what's the church doing if the whole world's running after it? Isn't the path narrow? Why are the whole church doing it when the whole world's doing it? And that's what this was talking about. Get out from Babylon. The system, the world we live in, whether it's our calendar, our governments, whether it's the media, whether it's the church system, the whole lot, it's Babylon. It's all been infiltrated. It's all been corrupted. And basically, if you want to be a Bible-believing Christian, it's very hard to stay in the church system that we have today and to be faithful and to honour God. So one of the key reasons why I'm involved with House Church is because I don't have to be tied down by all these pagan systems that have infiltrated the church. And that's how I would prefer to be. And I don't know about you, but I have much more peace of mind and peace of spirit by honouring him and his word than what I do 
going to church. Let me give you an example. Many years ago, it was before I met my wife, so it's probably about 30 years ago, it was Christmas Day, and I was thinking to myself, I should read the Gospel of Luke about the Christmas story. So I sat down and started reading it, and I thought, well, today's all about this, and this is why I should be reading it. I was grieved in my spirit, and I thought, that's weird. Why is it that when I'm celebrating Jesus and I'm reading the scripture that I'm so grieved in my spirit? Well, I didn't know at the time. It took many years later to find out. The reason why the spirit in me was grieved was because God was trying to tell me that, hey, this day isn't about him. It wasn't until years later that I found out that it was actually pagan. So how did I know that when I didn't even know about the pagan history? Well, God's Holy Spirit does witness to us. So it's much easier for me now in a house church not to be caught in that trap and not to be caught up in all the hoo-ha that goes with the big churches, no matter how genuine it might seem. So feel free to enjoy the liberty of obeying God's word, the scriptures, and hearing the Holy Spirit. This is the freedom you have in house church. We'll have more next week. God bless and bye for now.